I'm fascinated with the talent here. By the way, does anyone hear me well? Because I'm soft spoken, so I want to keep that in mind. Uh, just in case. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've learned in the last few years. It's such that it's going to be hard for me to go back tomorrow, back home, uh, on a plane and go to a place where uh, people, you know, people are more cold. <laughs> Maybe it has something to do with the weather, too, Maybe. right? <laughs> but uh, I want to thank you all for uh, just hosting me the way you have. It's going to feel so welcome uh, to the point that I uh, come to the park here tomorrow. And uh, Rafael uh, speaks in terms of the HTI, I highly recommend it also. Uh, just look, look into it as much as you can and see what it has to be offer you. Uh, and, uh, but this interesting thing in my experience with Rafael has been that the, the mentoring goes two ways, and I really mean that. Uh, it's been a learning process, a two way learning process. Learned as much from Rafael in our time uh, that hope is what it could be. And that's only in hope and you're a leap of faith. And all I know is that it's been such a blessing getting to know him and getting to work with him and uh, learning from him, really. Uh, and so I, I have to say thank you uh, for, for that. And one of the things that I learned very quickly very first conversation of how small the world can sometimes be. Um, so the HDI gives me the, the material and says, this is the student we would like you to, to work with. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. I, I made my first call to him and find out that our childhoods cross paths. His pastor, I mean, sorry, his father was pastor of a congregation and the other end of the street where my father continues to be a pastor. And so basically we shared a block in New York City, East Harlem, New York, uh, growing <coughs> up. And so here we are again, life, God, uh, race, uh, whatever you want to call it, brings us back together again. And um, it's all my pleasure. So to make uh, the best time of uh, that I have with you, I want to start right away um, um, in, in my talk, and, and we hope that that I'll that I can allow some time for some engagement. And there's a beautiful, familiar face. It's great to see you again. Um, um, and so I would like to leave some time for some of you to Q and A engagement. So I'm going to jump right into what I have for us, uh, and I'll start. The, I'll start this by saying that although what we know of as U.S. Latino, uh, Latina theological discourse may still, to this point, seem to be a novel, new elaboration to some in the mainstream of U.S. theology, it is actually possible to speak of three historical folds, or three historical unfoldings, or, or evolvements in the elaboration of, of U.S. Hispanic um, theology. These include, as you see up here, what I refer to as the inaugural unfolding of Latino theology that I date from 1975 to 1990, so those 15 years, I, I call the inaugural unfolding of Latino theology in the U.S. The second unfolding is from 1991 to the year 2000. And sometimes in my writings I've referred to this as the boom phase, uh, due to the rigorous growth in theological activity and publications that transpired during this time from 1991 to 2000. And then there is the third unfolding of Latino theology from 2001 to the present. Now, whether this more established background and these different historical unfoldings of Latino Christian academic theology um, is 
are recognized or not, I would suggest that just a moderately reflective glance at the published forms of these should be enough, I believe, to reveal the ingenuity and the accomplishments of U.S. Hispanic Latino theology. We are, after all, talking about a theological tradition that is burst forth with all sorts of reform interpretive and constructive innovations in the last 40 years or so. And I'm not even going to bother to count the many of these because it's, I have a page and a half of these. And I'm, I have time in mind. But just trust me when I say that there have been many innovations that have come forth in the 40 years or so in the existence of this theology. Um, now, I, I think, however, that even given all of this, this accomplishment, uh, this list of accomplishments, I find sometimes saddening that, that, uh, that the theology is yet not known to as many people as one would think it, it will be known. And I think that one of the reasons, it's not the only one, but I'm going to be very nice to them. Um, and so I'm going to speak about one in a nice, nice way. Um, I think that there are very other ones that are not as nice as one of the realities. But I think that one of the reasons why Hispanic or Latino, Latina theology has remained unknown or undiscovered by many in the wider arena of theological and religious scholarship is because it has mistakenly been identified, equated with, or lumped together with the liberationist theologies that have emerged in Mexico and in the Spanish-speaking countries of the Caribbean basin um, and of Central and South America. <coughs> but it is important to bear in mind that Latino theology is a North American theological tradition. It is, in other words, a theological tradition that is bred and based in the United States of America. And I would say that this theological voice flows from the thought, the writings, the activities of a heterogeneous group of theologians comprised of people who can trace their ancestry in some way or another to different parts of Spanish-speaking Latin America, but yet call the United States their home and have been doing so for a long time. And now finally, finally, as I see, in that such a long country, thankfully, thankfully we can say that the impressive list of accomplishments realized by this group of theologians is gradually drawing the attention of many within the theological and religious academy. If one takes some time to at least glance in the sorted works of this group of theologians, however, I think one would quickly notice that the subject of Jesus of Nazareth holds a special place in the archives of Jewish Hispanic theology. If one studies the published contributions of our theologian theologians, one will notice that from very early on, they dealt with the question of the meaning of Jesus for Christian thought and practice, and, I would add, the human quest for the sacred more generally. This interest, I think, is understandable, of course. First of all, Christianity does profess that Jesus reveals the nature and will of God that Jesus makes known the ultimate potential of humankind, and that Jesus exemplifies the standard of conduct that humans should emulate and promote. <clears throat> so I think that given the crucial character of these religious assertions, it makes sense that Latino theologians would feel the need to reflect on the person of Jesus of Nazareth and the question of his continuing significance. Quite simply, I think, they have properly recognized that no Christian theology would be complete without serious reflection on the person and relevance of Jesus of Nazareth. And so that explains the reason as to why there's been attention 
was there. Now this afternoon, I want to raise the curtain on one of the portraits of Jesus, one of the Christologies that has emerged from uh, U.S. Latin theology. And I speak here of the portrait of Jesus in the so-called Mestizo Christology, as we call it, that has been put forth by Mexican-American theologian Virgilio Elizondo. There, we're going to hold that picture there for a little while. As uh, I love these two because it captures him in the two contexts in which he has really worked. Uh, for a long time, he worked as a, uh, as a, as a minister, a Catholic a priest, a rector of the congregation, a huge congregation in San Antonio. So, right over there, you see him that way. And then in more recent times, he's been teaching in the University of Notre Dame more of an academic role here. And in the case of this particular subject matter of Jesus of Nazareth and Christology, I think it makes much sense that I would choose to focus on Elizondo and, and his work in this area. First, let me point out that Elizondo was the first Latino theologian to reflect on the identity of the historical Jesus. Second, among the various Latino theologians, he is the one who has written most extensively on the topic of the saving or liberating significance of Jesus. And third, he has come forward with the most creative and provocative, and for that reason too, the most familiar and talked about Christological overture um, that we find today in Latino theology. So in the remainder of my time with you, I would like to proceed in the following way. And when I get there, this is pretty much the way I, I teach for the consciousness so and follows my motif. Uh, every time I get to a certain point of my uh, lecture, I will mention exactly what I'm in mean, part one title. But basically, I, would, I want to proceed this way. In the first part of my lecture, my lecture has basically three parts. Don't worry. Too long, there's any time here available for us. But in the first part of my lecture, I want to offer a brief summary. That's the brief summary of Elizondo's depiction of Jesus as a mestizo savior, granting in the process a sense of his Christological intervention. So that's the first part of my lecture. In the second part, I want to touch on some of the shortcomings of Elizondo's rendering of Jesus and of his mestizo, mestiza, cristal. When seen especially through the lenses of more recent biblical scholarship and, yes, archaeology. In the final and third part, I will end by casting light upon one way in which Elizondo's central message and intention vis-a-vis -vis the view of Jesus and his Christology can be preserved and built on but with some slight modifications. So that's where we are. So part one, Virgilio Elizondo's portrait of Jesus and Christology. Now I think that if you could look through Elizondo's many writings on the topic of Jesus, reveal something that is unmistakable and captivating from the very beginning. It is that Elizondo makes much Galilean identity of Jesus. In fact, his books insist upon the thesis that in order to arrive at a sense of the meaning of the concrete human existence of Jesus, we must close in on the particularity and connotation of his Galilean heritage. What's more, they intimate that people of the hyphen, I call it, people, in other words, who live in and between cultures and may experience things like psychic dislocation, rejection, marginalization, and disrespect in society because of it. These people especially take stock of the importance of the Galilean identity of Jesus. This suggests, for instance, that 
American, so then I was almost really writing to, but then by extension, the rest of the Latino community. This suggests that Mexican Americans, specifically and Latinos more generally, should want to study the life story of Jesus because they themselves have often felt doomed to non identity and to marginalization by reason of their Mestizo background. By reason, in other words, of their mixed race or mixed ethnic or mixed cultural origin. But why, I would ask, should Mexican Americans, Latinos, and other Mestizo people of the world inquire into the importance of the Galilean identity of Jesus? According to Elizondo, it is because in Jesus, the Galilean, they will encounter one who is quite like them. One who has suffered division, rejection, and the threat of non-identity due to heritage and descent. The implication is that by looking into the cultural identity and life story of Jesus, Mexican Americans, Latinos, and other Mestizo peoples of the world will discover someone they can identify. That is, one who was a Mestizo, who experienced disdain and marginalization because of dissent and ethnicity, just as they do today. Furthermore, he suggests that Jesus of Galilee, they will also come upon someone that they can learn from and take after. One who showed in the flesh the potential of a new Mestizo consciousness. Gloria and Saldura likes to talk about. One who exemplified the transgressive healing transcendence that adheres within the dual or multiple identity of a Mestizo existence. So my question now turns to this. One might ask, what is the big deal with Jesus' Galilean permits? With Jesus' Galilean back? Why is it so noteworthy that Jesus hailed from a bucolic village known as Nazareth in the general region of Galilee? And I would like to put up there now that just a picture of the general region of Galilee. Because this is important for uh, for his own. He's always speaking about the Galilee and Jesus. And so the fact that Jesus hailed from Galilee is important. And so I'm asking, I'm asking you why? And what exactly is the saving, liberating, uh, illuminating significance of his Galilean identity and background? For Elizondo, what is noteworthy about the Galilee of Jesus' time is that it was allegedly a great border region between the Greeks and the Jews of Judea. That also, a place that also served as a natural crossing place for international travel routes. Galilee did not command much attention as a religious or intellectual center during Jesus' time, nor did it yield for economic and political influence in the time, but it was a borderland territory, he calls it, that served as a kind of crossroads for many diverse cultures and peoples, he suggests. I'm going to quote it. It was, therefore, he says, a land of great mixture and of an unborn mestizaje, where different cultures were continuously clashing, interweaving, and fusing to create new syncretic or hybrid cultural traditions. Now, we today might think that this would make for marvelous and admirable eccentricity kind of like a California uh, uh, world of mixture, right? You look at everything. But there is also reports in his writings that there is, good, there, is, that there is a good chance that this mestizaje, or in other words, cultural pattern of intermingling, gave Galilee and the people of Galilee a certain repute, or we might say, this repute. 
point to remember that we don't know all of this course is that at the time of Jesus, he suggests, Galilee was peopled by Phoenicians, Syrians, Arabs, Greeks, Orientals, and Jews, he says. And the proximities of this great diversity of peoples apparently contributed to a tremendous mixing of cultures, he says. A mixing that effectuated the negotiation of identities between the Jews and the Gentiles of the land. Elizondo explains and summarizes the outcome of this, I call it, kaleidoscopic merging in the following way. I'm going to quote it. In this mixed, commerce-oriented society, some Jews had allowed their Jewish exclusivism to weaken. Some of the non-Jews had converted to Judaism and intermarried with Jews. Religious ideas of other groups were also assimilated. And so a natural, ongoing biological and cultural mestizide and religious mestizide, he says, was taking place. That's his claim. This mestizide or co-mingling, however, was not regarded favorably by the dominant social, cultural, and religious hierarchies of Jesus' time. Galilean Jews, he says, were often doubly rejected as hybrid and as border persons, as people who lived in the crossroads of culture, in other words. So they were, on the one hand, scorned by those Gentiles who despised Jews, and on the other hand, regarded with patronizing contempt by the more pure-minded Jews of Jerusalem. So, again, he says, the natural Messiah of Galilee was a sign of impurity for some, and a cause for rejection for others. The Pharisees looked down upon the people of the land because they were ignorant of the law. The Sadducees looked down upon them because they were somewhat lax in matters of religious attendance and family, familiarity with the rules of temple worship, etc., etc. Moreover, says Alexander, the Galilean Jews probably spoke with a very marked accent and most likely mixed their language quite readily with the Greek of the dominant culture and the Latin of the Roman Empire. So, he says, in a kind of like joking way, but very serious kind of joke. Peter could deny Jesus, but there was no way he could deny he was a Galilean. The moment he opened his mouth, he revealed his Galilean identity. Kind of like some people say, you come from New York, right? Because they kind of like, you know what I mean? They kind of tell something about my, you know, my, I don't know what it is in a good way. Some people say my Rosie Perez, like um, <laughs> English or whatever it might be. Um, but anyway, you get the idea what he's talking about. That the, the, the Galilee marked Jesus, even to the point of perhaps his pronunciation of words. Now this all suggests then that by growing up in Galilee, Jesus assumed the personal identity and circumstances of what he calls, and his own book calls, a cultural mestizo. On the one hand, this implies that Jesus probably embodied and convinced the distinguishing marks of a borderlands person. The spiritual, perceptual, linguistic, and maybe even physical traits of one who is bicultural or of mixed heritage. But on the other hand, this might imply that in all likelihood, he also experienced the pathologies of oppression, the ridicule, rejection, and at times, shame-filled self-image that often goes along with a hybrid identity. In short, Elizondo believes that as a first-century Jewish mestizo, Jesus probably experienced the vulnerability that comes with the borderland's existence. The uneasy feeling of never being fully accepted, of never being quite at home or comfortable in any of the dominant cultural geographies of his time, and perhaps on occasion, not even quite at home in his own flesh. Now, this seems interesting enough in a historical or conjectural kind of way, but what is ultimately of substance for Elizondo is the way in which Jesus was able to take in and draw from his best 
peaceful Galilean particularity, turning it into a wellspring of positive identity and, of course, for social good in the face of adversity. In fact, although it was probably regarded with disfavor by most during his time, Elizondo insists that Jesus' mestizo identity was a source of providential consequence. And that's his main message. Jesus' beginnings in the mixed environment of reality, he suggests, allowed him the opportunity to learn not just from his Jewish faith, but also from the many other traditions that enriched his home territory. This provided fertile ground for the cultivation of an inner capacity in Jesus to move beyond the social and cultural borders of his time, in a sense, and to break the barriers of separation that those sometimes engendered. It was in Galilee, Elizondo intimates, that Jesus first learned to juggle cultures, to develop a plural personality in order to survive sanely. And it was through the process of this learning that he came to offer something new to his milieu, a mode of being that demonstrated a tolerance for contradictions and challenged the fixity of the delimiting human borders and categories of his time. Furthermore, and so that even insinuates that Jesus' identification was the most rejected of society, and the affinity he demonstrated toward the peoples of the periphery during his public ministry were at least in part the result of his mestizo origins and his own experience of rejection as a borderlands dweller. Now, I want to end very quickly by noting something here. And there's a connection that he wants to make between the Galilee of Jesus' time and the experience of many Latinos today. I want to very quickly move on here from the mind of time. Uh, and there, there is still, I'm going to point to Rabbi, there's still a little bit of Pentecostalism in him, even though I'm not Pentecostal, I haven't been, but I grew up in a Pentecostal thing, so I can, you know, I can get excited and preachy sometimes and go on this tangent. So I'm going to try to stick to the script here. Uh, but he says at a certain point, I'm going to quote him, being a Jew in Galilee, he alleges, was in some, in many ways, very much like being a Mexican-American in Texas today. Just as the Jews of Galilee were considered too Jewish to be accepted by the Gentile population, and yet too contaminated for pagan ways to be accepted by the pure-minded Jews of Jerusalem, so had the Mexican-Americans been rejected by two groups, the Anglos in the United States, and sometimes even the Mexicans in Mexico. But just as Jesus was able to generate new understandings and new modalities of communal life from the margins of his society, and just as he was able to come to positive terms with his status as an inside outsider, Elizondo believes that similarly, Mexican Americans now find themselves uniquely positioned to advance a liberating mission, not only for their own sake, but also for that of others. And there's a song. And he extends the same positive, saving message to the rest of Latinos, precisely because of their living in between worlds in the height. Part two. Some shortcomings of the video is almost missing, so Jesus in this time. Now, I, I tried to do it very quickly because there was just much more here, trust me. But I think that just with what I presented, there's a, no doubt about the ingenuity, the cogency, the salience of Elizondo's depiction of Jesus. His work offers, I think, us at once a unique rendering of the historical Jesus, an important presentation of the potentiality embedded within high dignity, and an inspiring message that urges us all towards greater altruism and emboldening for those who are marginalized in society to search for positive identity and to use it for good in society. These are all worthy credits. And one will doubtlessly find that in the writings of Arizona there are even more treasures than the ones I have talked about here. Nevertheless, 
it's important to know that John Dahl's opus is not without its shortcomings. One major drawback is that his claims about the Galilean world of Jesus do not square with recent information and ideas that emerge from the historical exegesis of scriptural texts and the archaeological study of Galilee. <clears throat> It is evident that Elizondo's portrait of Jesus rests on the premise that Jesus' Galilee was ethnically and culturally diverse. On the premise that Galilee was a region where a tremendous mixing of peoples and cultures took place, and where Jewish identity was being revived in an encounter with Greco-Roman ways and other Gentile ways. From Elizondo's vantage point, first century Galilee appears as a crossroads of culture and people with an openness to each other. And it is this image of a multi-ethnic, multicultural, melting pot like gallery that impels him to look upon Jesus as a likely cultural mestizo. That is, as one who probably an alloy Jewish of the great many non-Jewish traditions of flourishing his home territory. The problem is this, that recent scholarship is not certified as people. Over the last 20 years or so, historians and biblical scholars have been finding that there is less evidence than often supposed for the postulation of the Gentile, Gentile form of Mestizales or multi-ethnic Galilee at the time of Jesus. Much of scholarship of this, this, the time, sort of Jesus scholarship, but also scholarship on Galilee up to the 50s, believed along the line of Elizondo. So I believe that Elizondo might be really dependent on scholarship goes back to that time. But since that time, things have changed greatly. At present, scholars tend to think that Gentiles were not an especially large and influential group in Galilee, in the Galilee of Jesus' day, and that the villages and cities of first century Galilee were neither centers of Hellenization and Romanization, nor zones of ponderous cultural mixture. In other words, historians and biblical scholars now tend to believe that the ethnic, cultural, and religious identity of Jesus' Galilee was prominently and recognizably Jewish. Historians and biblical scholars are surely aware that Galilee was not far from Gentile purlieus, nor far from cosmopolitan areas where Hellenism, Romanization, and other forms of cultural assimilation were taking place. We're talking about Tahir, Sepapa, the municipalities in the loose confederacy of cities known as the capitals, for instance, are some things that we need to keep in mind. They also realized that there were at least two cities in Galilee that were growing during the time of Jesus, Cephas and Tiberias, and that some level of interaction between the Jews of Galilee and Gentiles in this region would have been inevitable and probably great. Furthermore, historians and biblical scholars allow for the probability that Galilee saw changes in its regional identity from time to time, as most other places of human dwelling do. These factors and the current understanding that all places and cultures experience cross processes of transculturation from time and space contribute to a growing recognition among scholars that the conceptualization of the Jewish Galilee need not, indeed should not, rule out the possibility of some level of synthesis or hybridization. However, two questions to consider here are these. How much hybridization and at what point in time? Elizondo would have us believe that Gentiles were numerous in the Galilee of Jesus' day, that an unusually high degree of Jewish-Gentile interaction took place in first century Galilee, leading to a good deal of cultural and even biological hybridization. However, the prevailing view among scholars today is that these things about Galilee are unsupportable. They happen, but much later on, not during the of time. The literary evidence is also, I want to point out, I don't want to go too far into this, but it's also insubstantial. Of the various references that are made to Galilee in the Hebrew Bible, in the Christian scriptures, in the rabbinic texts, and in other pertinent non-religious texts of antiquity, there are only five that appear to use the phrase Galilee of the Gentiles, which is 
portrait that is on those uh, pieces. Three of these appear in the Babylonian Talmud. The two other appear in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 in an apparent reference to Isaiah and then in an apparent reference to Isaiah found in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 4 verses 15 and 16. So the sparseness of this list of references to the wedding is a clue that there is little textual data to support the idea of a Gentile uh, or culturally hybrid gathering. Now let me skip very quickly to the, the matter of, and, and, and if you look at the Gospels, I don't want to go out of time here, but if you look at the Gospels, they're very clear in many different ways of the Jewishness of Jesus. Over and over and over and over again. There are many, many clues, and later on we can speak if you want to look at the examples. I'll be glad to, to point them out. I have them here, but I'm running out of time. But in light of mine, I want to point out that archaeological evidence also appears to discredit the idea of the Gentile gallery. Artifacts, for instance, found inside of domestic spaces in Galilee and believed to date back to the middle of the first century suggest that the ethnic and religious identity of Jesus' Galilee was firmly Jewish. Everything we're finding here points to that. Stone vessels used for Jewish rites of purification. Plaster pools, which most people think to be Greek gods, or Greek bones, or in other words, ritual baths, used for ritual purity custom. Signs of secondary burial of human bones, which we want to believe that inhabitants of Galilee were acquainted with Jewish burial practices at the time. Collections of animal bones that reveal the absence of pig bones, which points to the possible compliance with kosher law. These kinds of archaeological discoveries and others give one to understand that Galilee was essentially Jewish in the first century during Jesus' time. So where then do these interpretive and archaeological considerations leave us in the author of the construction of first century Galilee and in Zondo's depiction of Jesus as a mestizo Galilean savior? Well, they leave us with some questions in mind. Let's put it that way. With a sense of, huh, how much really was happening there? Number three, my last part. From mestizahed to marginality, or way out, or way in. From mestizahed to marginality, a way out, or way in. Now the defect that I have detected in the writing of Alessandro is, I can say, requires some memory. But I want to point out that it does not invalidate the importance of his work. The positive points and contributions I uh, still stand. Moreover, I submit that the basic message of Elizondo's overture can still be upheld, even if with some revision. The essential point that Elizondo wants to get across is that Jesus of Nazareth accomplished inspiring things in life and even carried out a world-changing, saving mission, even though he was a marginal and marginalized Jew from rural Galilee. He seems to be on target with this acknowledgement and premise. Elizondo strays off the mark only when he attributes Jesus' marginality to his supposed mestizo or mixed cultural identity. This particular description seems far-fetched given some of the things I've known. However, Jesus can be said to have been a marginal and marginalized Jew in other ways. For example, one can note that we hear almost nothing of Jesus in non-Christian literature of the first century. So, but a blip in the radar screen of antiquity, of, of, of literature and antiquity. So marginal in that sense. That Jesus was a humble fellow and apparently ordinary woodworker or tecton, or anything, person who worked with hand, who hailed from an uninspiring, you learn more and more, an out of the way rural village in Galilee. So marginal in that sense, from that part of town, 
all the time people ask me, Ben, where do you hail from? And I tell them, New York City. And then they tell me, what part of New York City? Manhattan. And then they say, money making Manhattan. Little do they know I was living in the part that was not making the money. <laughs> right? I was in Spanish Harlem, East Harlem. So where, you know, you, see, you know what I'm trying to say, where you hail from. You know what I mean? So although I was in New York City, and although I was in Manhattan, I was in a marginalized, in some sense, part of town. Marginalized in many ways, economically, right? Sometimes even in terms of the voice you want to have politically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. See what I mean? Jesus also apparently never attended any scribal school nor studied under any noted teacher. So it could be thought to be marginal in that sense. Sometimes I talk to people that Jesus was around today and came with his message. Many people today would be saying, by what authority? Do you have a degree from Claremont School of Development? <laughs> Do you have a degree from Andover Newman? Does the ABC, the UCC, the United Methodist Church have given you accreditation? And Jesus would be going to say, none of the above. Marginal in that sense as well. See what I mean? Also, we need to account here that around the age of 30, Jesus embarked on an itinerant mission to the Jewish peasant class, but without the backing of official office, without the backing of traditional channels of authority, or scribal learning, so marginal and marginalized in that way as well. We can point out that Jesus' prophetic and apocalyptic message was not well received by everyone during his time. Sometimes marginal and marginalized in that way. In fact, in his own hometown, rejected to the point of Jesus' temper to the point of cursing the folk of Nazareth for not listening to him. Marginalized in that way. And we can also point out that he was put to death in a humiliating and brutal way at a public execution outside the gates of Jerusalem on charges of sedition against the Roman state. Marginal even at the point of death. Uh, Orlando Costa wrote very early on a book called Christ Outside the Gate because he was crucified outside the gate of the city. So marginalized even in that sort of sense. Not good enough to be brought to death inside the center of power. So marginal in that way as well. These aspects of Jesus' life, and I'm very close to end the question, public career and death suggest some ways in which he might be considered marginal, whether for reasons of historical obscurity, or for humble providence, or reduced economic circumstances, or lack of education, or itinerant and charismatic religious vocation, or rejection, or humiliating death outside the gates of the city. Jesus can be said to have been marginal or marginalized in all of these ways. And yet, despite these apparent historical or material limitations, Jesus still carries out a liberating and saving message. So from the margins comes the saving message. And I believe that much of what Elizondo is trying to accomplish can be accomplished simply by making the movement from the category of men's society in this case to the category of marginality. And I think it was absolutely perfectly well. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing from you. What are your 
Let's talk about the simple rule. I'll but I would say that I think El Mundo starts making the initial movement in that is the most recent for the audience of the previous Building some ways to point out what we need to be done on the 
know very much that people are going to say, I am not. People who are here are teaching to what I call justice. Point out that the issue of marginalization is an issue of justice. And people are wandering on the whole different way. People are wandering on the whole different way. And so the issue of marginalization is an issue of justice. The next step, I think, is, is what I'm starting to see is the phenomenon of what we might call the state of the It's the marginality of the I want to know the nature of the global world where you have people that are seen to be Thank you. 
question of in, in a society of the time, rule making for a certain way, they want to be the whole issue of identity. Thank you. 